When people come to visit my layout, one of the first things they notice is the rocks. Everybody wants to know, how did you do those rocks? You know, rocks add so much to a model train layout, yet they're very fast, very easy to do. Simple techniques, very low cost. All it takes is a little bit of practice and a little bit of know-how. And that's what we're going to work on here today so that you can build rocks like these. Sometimes you can even use the face of the rock to represent a glacier if you want to have a glacier. One question people have when starting out is what do rocks really look like? I want them to be realistic so I'm sure I need some reference. And that's where books like this are handy. This is a book called The Maine Coast. It's published by the American Geographic Publishing, part of their Maine Geographic series. It's a very valuable book. I've had it for a long time, and it shows rocks around in Maine. Uh, you know, if you model Colorado, a book on Colorado will do the same type of thing. Here you can see not only the color of the rocks, but how the vegetation is above. Very unusual grain in that rock. Very similar to what's in this piece of petrified wood. That would make a great mold right there. Now here the rocks are gray. Lots of detail on them and shadows. These rocks are flat, down by the ocean. Lots of wave action on them. But uh, you can see how they're sunk in. You can see how the wetter areas are darker than the areas higher up which rarely get any water. Little details like that make a difference. Here also on the coast is some rust colored rocks so there's no absolute set way that these things are done. I like this photo because it shows the texture of the rock as well as the different grains in it and everything. Now on this little pier they've used cut rock and as the tide has gone in and out, you can see that the rock at the bottom is weathered a lot more than the rock at the top. Of course, all this rock started out as the same color, but it has changed as time has gone on. Now let's talk about molds themselves. Making rock molds is easy. You just need a few basic materials. Of course, one of the first things you need is a rock. I'm always on the lookout for rocks that look good when it comes to making molds. This one I really like. It's got lots of different angles, lots of different surfaces on it. It's a large rock so I can make a large mold or I can make several small ones off of it. It's got a variety of surfaces, little cliffs built in, lots of grain. Very nice. Turn it on the end and it's got that distinctive wood grain that uh, we noticed and talked about earlier for that unusual looking rock. Good mold could be made of that. And on the other side, again, more grain. A mold could also be made of the top of this rock as well as the bottom of it. Now for the material we're going to use, we're going to use Woodland Scenics latex rubber. Now my choice for Woodland Scenics is not because it's better than any of the others, but rather because it's readily available. We can get it from Walther's. Your local hobby shop probably has some or certainly can get it from Walther's. It goes on evenly. Uh, it works very nice, comes in small containers, uh, and it, it just it's always seems to be fresh. I've had problems over the years with different brands uh, being dried up when I actually got them. And with the Woodland Scenics, it seems to sell fast enough that there's not a problem with that. Woodland Scenics makes lots of really good products for scenery. Now when we brush the latex on, I don't thin that first coat down or anything, but I am very careful with it to make sure I get it down into all the cracks, and all the crevices, and the corners of the rocks. It's those cracks and crevices and those corners which really give detail to your rock mold. So it's very important to get this first coat on very evenly. You want to make sure you don't make a bunch of air bubbles in it. Just smooth it on, and you also want it to be very thin. You're just sort of like painting that rock, just like you're taking some house paint and you're just painting it. That's all you're really doing there. We're not going to cover this whole rock. We're just going to cover a portion of it uh, because molds, when they get too big, are actually hard to use. We'll talk more about that later. 
Now here I've painted the whole rock and I've let it dry for a couple of days and I'm ready to put on the second coat. Down in those crevices you want to make sure that the, the mold is transparent, that it's completely dry before you put the second coat on. Now the second coat doesn't have to go on nearly as thin as the first coat did. So you can be very liberal in putting it on. The best way to do these is to have uh, five or six different rocks set up and work on each one. These little disposable paintbrushes that I use, after they've been used for one day, it's awfully hard to get them completely clean. So they're only about 59 cents, so I discard it at the end of the day and start off with a fresh one each time. We put five or six coats on each rock. Now a lot of people uh, put gauze in the, the mold to strengthen it, and that's what I'm showing here. This is ordinary gauze like you buy in the first aid section at the grocery store. You push it down into that fresh latex. You just want to make sure it gets all the way down in there very nicely. You don't have to put the gauze in. Some people like to avoid the gauze so that there's more flex and stretching to the mold. I find that it uh, strengthens it enough that it makes it worthwhile. I've had molds that I, that I prepared over 30 years ago that still work fine today. So it takes a little bit of time and effort. Now you notice I almost dropped that uh, that latex down onto that book underneath there. So it's good to actually protect the things underneath where you're doing this. Um, I'm going to slip a little piece of paper under there just to keep it from dripping down onto those books because it's hard to get off of things like that. Just as a little protection. And then I continue adding another strip of the gauze. Overlapping the first one by oh a quarter of an inch, maybe half of an inch. You can tap it in with your fingers, whatever it takes to actually work it down into that latex. And again, each of these coats you want to let dry thoroughly. You want to put five or six coats on, so it's going to take you a week to ten days, maybe two weeks to actually do one. Another excellent material is coal. Here you can see all the different grain that's in this chunk of coal. Coal really makes beautiful rock molds, and fortunately coal is available in many parts of the country. It's not available everywhere, but it's available in a lot of places. Of course now after I've made these molds and I enjoy making them but I actually end up using store-bought molds more than any other. Uh, Bragdon Enterprises makes good molds and there's a, a, a company called Rocky Mountain Molds that also make very good molds. When you make a mold like this you want to just make sure you cover all the area. Make sure that you don't go around the rock because then you'd be very hard to get the mold off and the same with pouring the plaster. Now here you can see I actually worked on several at a time. Now this one here I've already pulled the mold off just so that it could illustrate uh, what the mold's going to look like when it's done and also notice on the back of it I've painted an arrow. See that arrow? I do that so that I know which way the grain is in that rock. I make a casting with it and then I put an arrow so I do it so it's vertical. That way I make sure all the grain in my rock castings runs the same direction. Now here I'm actually peeling the mold off of this chunk of coal and you're going to see this mold really sticks to this material. Very hard to get it off. See how, how tightly that is? It's just like glued on there. So very hard to pull it off and one thing with coal it certainly makes a big mess when you unpeel it. You can see the pieces just going everywhere so it's best to do this outside. Here in Alaska we don't have sunny days long enough to to do this for two weeks uh, but in California you have long periods of time so uh, I do this inside and just am prepared to clean up the mess. And you can see there, once I finally get that off, I'm being careful not to break it, the lump of coal actually broke. So you can, when you use that same piece of coal again to make molds later, it's going to be different because so much of the coal itself come off. Okay, now after you get it off, next thing you got to do is you got to pick out all those little chunks of coal and get rid of all of them. 
takes a long time to do that, but it's certainly worthwhile. That's a mold that's going to last me for years and years. There's that chunk of coal that you can make another set of castings from with no problem at all. Now we're going to proceed with actually doing the casting itself. When we use the casting, you can use Hydrocal or you can use Plaster of Paris. A lot of people really like Hydrocal. I personally, I've been casting rocks for 30 years. I've used both. I just much prefer plaster. But again, it's a personal choice. I like plastering by it in these nice convenient little tubs. It's easy to work with. It's a little softer for carving. It's not quite as hard as Hydrocal. Need a plastic tub to hold water in. Need a little spatula and a little bowl for mixing it in. I use these little cups like this to measure the water and of course you need the molds themselves. Now I've gotten to the point to where I use store-bought molds more than my own. Now I'm pointing there at that piece of wood that I have there to protect the surface that you're working on. Very important for that. Now there's not an exact formula for how much water to put in, but here I'm going to put in two cups of water, then I'm going to add four cups of plaster. Now the brand of plaster you use doesn't really make a big difference. I'm using DAP right here, but I've used all different brands. The only thing I recommend is if you stain your rocks that you stick with the same brand because the plaster that comes from each brand is a little different. Okay, so there I've got two parts of plaster to one part of water. Now I just start taking and folding the water, the plaster around to get the water into it. Now you're not really beating it to stir it. What you're doing is you're letting that water actually blend into the plaster. For this first set that we're going to do here, I've got quite a bit of working time. So there's no big hurry on that. In fact, what I do when I get ready to make my actually pour into the molds is I get the molds themselves wet. Drain out most of the water, set it down. I'll do oh, a couple of molds. Get them wet, drain out most of the water, and then uh, well, we'll set up a third one here. I don't think this batch will make that many. And you set your little tub of water aside. You don't want to pour this stuff down your sink. You want to use a tub of water. So there we're just stirring it around. Let me get a little closer. You can see how thick this is. Okay, now we're getting a close-up there, and when I stir it, you can see how still a little lumpy there, but you can see this is pretty watery, and that's what we're after. We're, uh, I don't know how to describe the consistency. That's what I'm trying to show you there. Just make sure it's well mixed. Still a little lumpy. So I'm going to add just a tiny bit more water to that. And by tiny, I mean tiny. I mean three or four tablespoons. Uh, don't put another half cup in there. Uh, you'll end up with too much water in it. Now this makes for a real watery batch there. And it would be awfully hard to get all that water mixed into that plaster. But you want to stir it around. You don't want to try to, to get a lot of air bubbles in there. See those air bubbles that's there at the side? What I try to do is instead of taking the uh, spatula in and out a lot, I try to keep that spatula in there. And there you can see an idea of just how thick that is. And that's about the ideal consistency, about like that. Hopefully you can tell what that consistency is. Okay. And there's always more water on the top. So when you get your mold ready, first thing we're going to do, we're just going to pour off some of that water onto the top, onto the first mold just to get rid of some of that water off the top. See how thin that is? That's too thin to be of any much value to us. Okay, once that loose water is off, then I go to the mold I'm going to actually want to work with the most. Dump out any remaining water, and then I just put this in real thin. Notice I'm sort of stirring it with the spatula there 
to just sort of make it slop out a little bit. We want to make sure there's no air bubbles here. That's the main thing we want to avoid at this point. Just smooth it out. Keep adding a little bit at a time. Get over close to the edges of the mold. Try not to go over the edges of the mold. You can prop these up with uh, little scraps of plaster, lots of different ways to prop up the edges of the mold if you want. But I find I can work with it fine most of the time with it just laying flat like this. The amount of plaster you put in here, the more you put in, the heavier it's going to be. If you're working with a portable layout, you may even want to use a, a different material. You can use uh, uh, there's a foam material. I've never used it, but some people like it. I know Bragdon Enterprises sells it. Uh, they uh, rave about it, uh, but I've never tried it. This works so well that I'm just really afraid to try anything else. This just works great. Want to immediately clean up your little spatula? Got plenty of time to work. Uh, this uh, plaster would take uh, at least a half hour to set up, so you got a lot of time. Now this water that is in this blue tub, it gets a lot of plaster into it as you clean, and what happens is that plaster in that water acts as an accelerant. So your next batch is going to set up more quickly, and you'll actually get it to the point to where uh, these set up in about five minutes. But this first batch using just plain water it's going to take 30 45 minutes to set up what you want to do is uh, after you've cleaned your material you want to shake your molds a bit try to get rid of any air bubbles that are uh, down at the bottom I'm even shaking the table a little bit and you can sort of tell when it starts to set up just right when you lift it up you'll see the water runs off but as long as the plaster stays there it's fine you look for little fine cracks in there that generally indicates that you can pick it up and work with it. So I'm just going to pour that extra water onto that one there. Now I'm coming back and yeah, now it's to the point to where I can lift that up fine and that plaster is not going to fall out. But that's a very thin coat. You don't want it quite that thin, but we're just trying to show you uh, that the plaster should not come out easily. I'm just going to let that one set a little bit more. Now here's where I'm working. Underneath this hill I have uh, styrofoam that I've shaped and I've covered it with paper towels soaked in plaster. I'm going to take the mold I want, actually want to use here. I'm going to hold it up into place. Now again I've got that arrow so I know that this is vertical because I've used it before and I know how the grain goes. And you'll notice I'm overlapping it there a bit on the right. And that's what I'm trying to demonstrate here, is how to use a large mold. And when you use a large mold, you will be overlapping your earlier work. Now for this mold here, I go, I go ahead and I pour my plaster in. Cover it evenly. You can see how thin that plaster is. It's, it's thicker than water, but you can see by how well it flows around there that it's not a lot thicker than water. Put that plaster in, scrape it in, go clean your bowl, and then come back and check your plaster and see how well it's doing. And we're just evening that out as best we can. Then we're going to shake it a little bit. I pick it up from the ends and the sides and try to make a cup out of it. See how I cup it a little bit when I lift it? so that the plaster flows to the middle of the mold rather than flowing out to the sides. But you're going to get some overlap and spillage, and that's why that paper's under there. It really helps. Now here I've let this set long enough. There's where I'm going to be putting this mold again, like well, I had had it up there before. Now what I'm doing here is I'm taking water in a sprayer and I'm soaking it. I'm really getting it thoroughly wet. Now that casting that's already on there uh, needs to really be soaked or else it'll just suck the water out of this one I'm putting up there now. You can see how it folds and bends but it doesn't flow so that's perfect. So I just lay it up into place, try to get it as well as I can and then I actually push it 
on the center. See how I'm pushing towards the center and then I'm working towards the outside edges? Now over on the left hand side, it's not overlapping plaster, so the fit isn't very critical. But over on the right hand side, you really want to hold it and make sure it's just right. And what you need to do is you actually need to hold it there for a while until it starts to set up. What I do is I will let it set there for a while and then I'll, in that lower left hand corner, I'll peel it up and see how it's doing. But I won't disturb that that's there on the right. Now once it's completely set up, I just start peeling it off. You don't want this stuff to set overnight. You want it to get hard. Uh, maybe about an hour for uh, the fresh batches. Then as you get practice, it'll go more quickly. While it's still fairly soft, you just take your X-Acto knife and start chipping away where that mold on the left has joined the mold on the right. And as you chip it, you try to chip it so it sort of matches the pattern of the mold, the casting that's already there. Now areas where there's air pockets underneath, well you're just going to cut that away like I'm doing there. There I got a little plaster up there. You keep working at that. Hard to tell you exactly how much to do this, but just keep working at it until you don't have any real big gaps there. Now you can see there's just a small gap there. Now again, I take and I get that very wet. And what I'm doing is I'm mixing up a little small amount of, of uh, plaster and I'm using a fan brush. Notice this brush is very flat and small. And what I can do is I can pick up plaster with that and just brush it right into those cracks and make that disappear just like this just brush it in like that do this all along the whole area where that mold joined the old mold just fill in all the cracks using this you want to keep it wet any place there's a hole or anything just go ahead and fill it in keep it wet and you can see how there's no longer that big gapping hole there it's filled in very nicely then as it dries, you want to get any loose parts off or at least get them down into a crevice. Then you just want to work a little bit with it to get a little bit of texture on it so that it sort of matches the rest of the area. You don't want it to be shiny. There, when you pull back, you can see how well that blended. Now the next method we're going to use is one where we actually use broken casting pieces. When you have uh, your molds you're going to find there's little chunks break off and here this one's all set up and ready to go now so I'm going to turn it over and peel that mold off and you're going to see there's chunks. See like that chunk right there those chunks? That's what we're actually going to use on this next method is chunks like that. If you don't have enough to cover the area that you're going to be working with of course you can take one of these castings that you've made like this and break the whole thing up and use the individual pieces you're going to find certain kind of pieces are going to work for you better and certain types of uh, uh, castings are going to look better with this method but this is a good way to cover an area that's not flat that first large mole worked well because we were covering basically a large flat area with a gentle curve to it uh, but the next area we're going to be working on is one that has a lot of variations so you just make sure you clean your molds as soon as you get the plaster out too. Just put them in there to soak. That keeps that plaster soft. So there you can see we don't have a really good casting. We got chunks. It's just not going to fit in any place you try to fit it in. Lots of pieces. When we do the same thing with this one here, well this one's very thin. We end up with a lot of chunks here as you can see. So we always end up with a lot of chunks that we can use. So never throw away any of your old chunks of plaster. Any leftover bits, you hang on to those. Now here I'm actually got a, a pretty nice piece and some more chunks that I'm going to use. And again, none of them fit together perfect, but uh, by fitting them together like that, you can come up with some pretty good areas, but you've got to blend them together, and that's what we're going to work on. 
So here what I did was I put a casting across the bottom of this area and across the top but there you can see that pale blue showing through. That's where I need to fill in between these other molds. So sometimes instead of overlapping molds, what you can do is just take a chunk like this and see how it's going to fit in. Now this is a big long flat piece and that's a pretty rounded area there. So it just wouldn't work as it is. So don't be afraid to bust them. Just bust them and put the pieces in. And that way you can put the pieces in just where you want the pieces to go. Sort of like doing a jigsaw puzzle. Just keep working with it. You want to make sure that when you put it in place that it stays there. So what I'm doing is I'm taking a little knife and poking a hole in that plaster hard shell so that that piece will stick pretty much in place. Then I'm going to put some glue on the back and the glue I use is Arlene's Tacky Glue. It's a real thick white glue. You can use uh, glue from a glue gun or you can even put plas patching plaster on the back of it and stick it on that way. We're not trying for a perfect fit. We want to make sure all our strata, all the grain in the rock runs the certain, certain, same direction. I like it to run level, but it can be at any angle just so it's all consistent. And just continue to find pieces that fit together just like a jigsaw puzzle and glue them in place sure to let this glue dry completely before you blend these together with the wet plaster that we're going to be using later. And you just proceed like that until you get the area pretty well covered. Now if you got a heavy piece what you can do is take a T-pin, buy these at dress shops, and put it underneath to hold it in place until the glue dries. And just keep on adding pieces like that and working around. Now this is a reasonably flat area there, but it helps to get really good detail by doing it this way. Take your time. Just enjoy what you're working on. Now over on this area here, I've got, uh, you see the contours are quite different, so being able to put the individual pieces in place works very well. These are all glued in. Now I'm going to blend them together and I'm really soaking this thoroughly with water just like I did on the other side. And here I've got a little cup with thin plaster in it. And there's my fan brush. Now in an area like this I got all these individual small pieces to put together. Take me forever to work that that plaster in an area like this. So what I do instead I use a little a syringe. You can get these at the drugstore. These they use to give medicine to babies. So just tell them you want a, one of the little throwaway syringes. You can't use these with needles so there's no concern there. What you do is you put that real watery plaster and you just shoot it in to the cracks like that. See how quick and easy that is for filling in those cracks? Just shoot that liquid plaster in there. Of course, you got to keep that plaster very thin. Now, you can get great big ones of these syringes if you're doing a lot. You can get those at uh, veterinarian clinics. They use it for giving medicine to horses and things like that. Then take a small brush and go around and just blend in. You don't want balls of plaster showing. Those balls is what you get when you shoot the plaster in. It's very round but you just want to flatten it out and blend it in with a, a small brush like this. Keep it wet. You want to break up the surface of the plaster too because the, the plaster you injected in there, if you just leave it, it will dry with a shiny coat and you want to avoid that. So you don't want to fill in all the cracks because all rocks have some cracks in it. Just keep working on it, patiently working at it, getting it just right very easy to do. Now, look at it a little bit. See any areas that uh, need to be filled in and worked on. Go ahead and do it now. Once you get these all filled in, then you're going to set and let it set up for uh, a day or so and get really hard before you color it. Just spray some water. The water will actually ex expose areas where it's real thin plaster where you need to add more. 
So just continue to work on it. Be patient with this. These rocks are going to be there for a long time. Now what I've got here is a close-up and I've just got an exacto knife and where there's little air bubbles that have formed in your rocks just uh, cut them out by working it away and anything that doesn't look right just go ahead and trim it. If you keep these castings wet it'll be very easy to carve them with the exacto knife. Once they get completely dry they become very very hard but keeping them soaking wet makes it easy to, to carve. Now up above this tunnel portal I've done the same thing. I've used these chunks and you can see all those individual chunks that I've glued up there into place. Once again I saturate it very well with water. Come back with my little uh, syringe. This kind of plaster has to be very thin or it won't pull up into the syringe. And just stick it right in there and squirt it in and you can just cover an awful lot of area very quickly here. Now when you mix up these little batches of plaster don't mix up very much at all. This is a two ounce cup so keep it small mixes because it sets up pretty fast and if you don't use small mix up small amounts you're going to have to throw a bunch away. An eight pound box of plaster will do an area oh, about as big as what you can see here and do a good job of it. And up here in Alaska an eight pound box costs three fifty nine. So you're talking for this whole area here you're talking about four dollars uh, not counting the molds and the paints are virtually free. And once you have a few molds well they'll last forever. Again you can get good molds from Bragdon Enterprises and from Rocky Mountain Molds. Both companies make rock molds that are, uh, produce this type of effect here. And just blend them together, just poking lightly there. You don't want any globs of plaster sticking out. You just want it to be very nice and work very slowly with this. And you end up with uh, these rock molds uh, uh, don't take long at all. I use rock castings a lot just to fill in an area quickly. If I later want to go through and make a city scene or something like that, I'll just put a mountain of rocks over it for the time being. And then when I have time, I'll go back and do it again later. So that's how we do it with these where we've used the broken rocks. Now we're going to talk about more of the overlapping method. Now with this, this is where you use very small castings to cover a large area. And this is actually, seems hard, but it's actually one of the easiest ways. Now I'm going to illustrate there. That white area represents our mountain. And where I'm dipping into the brown paint, that represents mold. So here we're going to we'll put our first mold. We'll mix up the plaster and we'll put it in place right there. Then we'll take a second mold and we'll put it over in a different area fill up another mold, put it in a third area like this. And then a fourth mold, fill it with plaster and put it over here. And by the time you get done with that fourth one, that first one is ready to have the mold removed. So you remove the mold and you take another mold, fill it with plaster and you overlap that first mold just like that and then by then this one's ready to be removed and another mold can be put right over it there and just continue to work on around like this in an area and this way you can have four castings going all the time just as fast as you can work these things will set up then you get down to where you're close to the end you just keep working the same pattern with these small molds hand sized molds and then eventually you get to the point to where you've completed your whole area. Very easy to work with. Now in order to do that you need small molds. Now Woodland Scenics makes some good products. Uh, these molds are fine, these black ones are Woodland Scenic molds. They're fine uh, for just making one rock casting. 
but you can't blend them together. They're so stiff. It's hard to get the castings out. Uh, I really don't recommend these particular molds. They're fine if you just want one rock or something like that, but the, really the best way to do it is to use flexible molds. Now the flexible molds can be, see how much more flexible that is? Then you can do a lot with that. And they'd be different sizes. Some of them are fairly big. All of these are nice and flexible. Let's see, about the hand size. And I really like working with ones that are about the size of your hand. Like that. That's a good size mold to work with right there. And even smaller. The little small mold like this. This is a beautiful mold. Uh, I've used it a lot. It works great. Just all kinds of different sizes and shapes of molds. Now this piece I'm picking up here, this is about the largest piece that's really easy to work with with overlapping molds. Now occasionally you'll get a great big mold like this. This was one that I purchased and you can see as far as my hands go there's a lot of room for molds there. So what I did was I bought this one and looked at it and realized that I could take this one big mold and cut it down and have several small molds. Now a big mold like this costs about forty dollars. So if I'm going to cut it up I want to be very careful in my cutting up. So when you look at the mold you have to analyze which areas are going to look the best all cut up. So just take a few minutes and look at the mold. Now here I see this area here has a whole different pattern than the rest of it does. Let me show that a little more closely. Now here in this corner, there's good detail here, but it's large flat areas. See nice big flat pieces? Right there under my fingers you can see the fairly large areas there, like that right there large flat areas. So that's one style of casting is going to come out of there. Right next to it you can see a lot of little strata, a lot of little pieces sticking out. Not at all like that on the other side. See lots of little bumpy areas there. So that would be a good area to make a cut. Then over in the other end is another area where it's fairly flat. That would make a nice mold by itself. So what you do is you take one of these molds like this, you figure out where you want to cut, and when you cut, you don't want to cut right at the edge of where you want. You want to keep it about this size, no bigger than that. And when you take your scissors and you actually go to cut it, you want to cut it and leave yourself about an inch over size. Figure out what you want for a mold and, and cut about an inch extra area around it. So I'm just going to take my scissors and cut right through this mold, just as simply as that. I'm going to take that and I'm going to trim this area here. Now that portion on the right is that nice areas with flat areas. The portion on the left, that small piece, is really rough textured. See, so I've got a nice mold there, just about hand size, ideal to work with. So that's one good mold I've got out of that big mold. And one big mold is just too big to try to work up onto your layout. But by working with small sections it makes it easy. Now I don't want to throw the rest of the mold away. I want to look at that area there where my hands are and I can see where sort of like a border is of the, the texture there. So I can uh, cut it in different ways. I can cut all the way across. Different ways of cutting something like that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start at one end and I'm just going to cut it like that. It's pretty easy to cut through these molds. They're not that thick. Once you cut them it's hard to put them back together. So there it makes an interesting strip there. Just like that. I could use it just like that. If I want to use it just like that, that would be fine for a nice long mold. Got a nice long mold there too. Different ways of doing things with these molds. 
I'm thinking about it right now as to whether I want to cut it more or whether I don't. I'm just going to trim off some of the edges around there. Those little edges that stick out on some of these molds, sometimes they get caught in your plaster and they end up causing you a lot of headaches. So you might want to trim some of the really rough edges off. You might want to cut that in half if you, if you choose to. You don't have to. See what you can always do, you can always pour plaster in a piece like this and put that in place. Then after that's set up and removed, you can use the other end of the mold. So you don't actually have to cut it. You can uh, use just different portions of it. So anyway, that's one way to do with molds. So you actually end up with several good pieces there. See, I've got one, two, three, four good molds out of that $40 mold. So I've got four $10 molds there that will be much more useful for me. Now, coming to coloring of the rocks, this is a very important part, and the first method I'm going to demonstrate involves using earth tones first. Now here you notice I've got a large, cheap paintbrush. The particular paint that I'm using doesn't have to be this particular paint, but this is Delta Ceramcoat AC Flesh. It's just a very light tan. And that's what I'm going to start off with here. And what I am doing here is I'm working with light colors to start with, and then I'm going to be working progressively darker colors as time goes on. I want to get my surface good and wet, because I want these coats to go on very thin. I want these to be very thin coat. Even my paintbrush I ducked, dunked into water. And I'm putting a very thin coat of this very light color on here. Just starting at the top, working my way down, trying to cover all of it. Don't want to skip any parts, so it's got to be a thin coat so that it gets into all the cracks and crevices fine. And notice I'm using sort of a poking action there to get the paint into the crevices. Each time I reach over, I'm picking up some water. I've got a little cup of water over there that I put my paintbrush into. That helps all of this stay nice and thin. Now, after that has dried overnight, I'm coming back. Now's the next day. I'm re-wetting it again, and I'm going to be using a variety of other slightly darker colors. Now, here I've got a rust color. This particular rust color is Apple Barrel Colors brand. It's golden brown. And I also have some burnt umber. Burnt umber is a standard paint. Uh, many companies make it. And I'm going to be using this uh, golden brown and the burnt umber. So I'm starting with the golden brown. And you'll notice I'm not trying to cover the whole thing. I'm just picking different areas to paint with. Notice I also have a small paintbrush now using lots of water, picking up water. Started with the golden brown. Now here's a little bit of the burnt umber. And I'm just painting no no area in particular. Just I want a variety of colors. I want a lot of variety in the colors that are shown here. And I should mention too that the paints that I'm using are not oil paints, but are actually acrylic paints, artist paints. Just working a little bit at a time. I don't put a lot of paint on my paintbrush. I just work with small amounts and work in small areas. Unless you have a really huge layout, this should not be a problem. It's just an enjoyable part of the hobby. When applying these paints like this, I'm putting them on very thin and almost to the point of being watery to the point that they would run down the face. We don't want them to, to actually run down, but I am putting them on very thin. A little later I'm going to go back with a coat of black, and it's going to be extremely thin. So again, just trying to work the different areas, providing lots of variety. This particular area that I'm working in, that particular rock mold, was done using a petrified wood. Uh, we had a lot of it available up here at some point years ago, and then uh, it's no longer there. It got uh, covered. You know, when they build a dam or something like that, how certain areas get covered. Well, there was an area here where we could go get petrified wood pretty easily. 
hard to find, but if you come across some, it doesn't damage the wood itself or the rock itself when you make a mold. So if you come across a, a chunk of this at a store or something like that, uh, you can just uh, use a mold and it won't hurt it at all. Doesn't have to be a very big piece. Any kind of petrified wood seems to, to look good. It's that wood grain that actually makes it look good. Now here a little bit on the left you can see how thin it was. I have actually got a little stream of brown coming down there on the left. I want to pick up that uh, as quickly as possible. One advantage here of working over a painted surface as opposed to just raw plaster. If that had run down on raw plaster it would be no way to get that out without just repainting the whole thing. And just taking our time and just working from the top to the bottom again just having variations in the colors. When you go look at rocks you're going to see oh there may be sandstone deposits that are all uniform in color but most rocks when you look at a cliff there's just a lot of variation. Now this is how that variation looks close up. Now we're going to go back and what we're going to be doing is this is very thin amounts of really watered down black paint that I'm just touching and letting capillary action draw it out of my paintbrush. And what this does, this allows the, that black real thin paint to really work down into the cracks. So I'm just trying to touch it right where cracks are. I'm letting that black paint actually get down into there. Very small amounts of paint, working very carefully. Lots of water. It's helpful when you paint like this to let each individual coat dry before you go to the next. If this were still fresh paint that I were doing this with, this black would mix in with some of the other colors, and we don't want that to, to happen. Acrylics dry quickly, but we do let them need to dry between each color coat. Now let's go in a little closer so you can see a detail of exactly how this is working. Okay, here I'm going in and just touching little bits of black. Can you see how it just goes right into those cracks? Runs off the face pretty much, but goes right into the cracks. Again, do this very sparingly. You don't want to put a tremendous amount of paint on here. You don't want a tremendous amount on your brush. You let that dry and that area is going to be done. But there is another way of painting rock castings that I've gotten to the point this is the method that I really prefer. And this is putting a black undercoat underneath all the other paints. So instead of starting with light colors and working to darker colors, we're going to start with black. This is Delta Ceram Coat Black. Now I want to thin this down. I've got a little container there and it's pretty pretty watered down. I want it thin enough so that it will cover everything and get back into the cracks. But I want it to be thick enough too that I'm not painting it gray but I'm keeping it black. So again in a stabbing motion I'm just pushing that in and really trying to make sure it gets back into uh, the crevices. If you need to spray this a little bit, again this is a wet surface that I'm working with, but if you need to add more water, go ahead and do so. And just keep working until you get this whole area covered with black. Here I've moved forward a little bit and I'm still just working on this area. Hopefully you can tell that that's really thin paint that I'm putting on there. Tends to run a little bit in spots, but that's okay. We're going to do this whole area in black. Now when I pan in on that and you look at the colors, you can see the detail. And if you just want to have a dark black uh, surface, it's fine to leave it like that. The camera shows that's a, a good color there. Now I'm going to be using some burnt umber. We used this before. Now I've let that black dry completely. I'm coming back a few hours later and I'm putting this coat over. Now this one I don't put on really thin. This is uh, not uh, diluted down very much at all. The reason I want it to go on pretty much full strength is because I'm not trying to get the paint back into all those cracks and crevices. Now I'm just working on the surface area, the highlighted areas of the rocks. 
there's how it looks after you have put the whole coat on there. Now I'm going to be using a little more of that burnt umber and I'm going to be mixing in a little bit of apple barrel golden brown. And this is the colors that uh, go on next. I've let that burnt umber coat dry completely. Now I'm just going over this mixing the two colors so that it's not a solid color just like on that area to the right that we worked on earlier. I don't want everything to be a uniform brown color. I want it to be different variations of that same color. Moving forward a little bit, you can see I'm making a lot of progress covering the whole area. Again, just wanting to get it covered completely with that golden brown color. That's how it looks when it dries. Now I'm going to be using some uh, a lighter color. This is uh, the Delta Ceram Code AC Flesh. A little bit of titanium white actually using. So I've got that uh, the rust color and then some lighter colors and I'm just, now the exact colors I use it's important you know that I don't want you to go down to the store and look for these particular brands just look for a rusty color a tan color and an almost white color and I'm just putting those on again mixed areas so it's not all a uniform color and again I'm not trying to get this back down into the cracks of the rock I'm just hitting the highlighted areas of the rock. Can you see how that's really starting to bring out the the colors of the rock and the cracks are still well defined there? That's what we get with that black undertone base. Progressing a little further on this, just blending colors together. I don't want any sharp lines of colors really. Just want varieties of colors here. Very easy way to do this. It gives very good effects. Now here's a close-up of that. Now I'm taking a little bit of raw umber. I'm mil watering this down. My brush is very wet. Can you see that's very thin there? What I'm doing now is I'm doing detail work. This is what you'd want to do on a diorama especially, but I do this on my whole layout. I just go back with real watery. Can you see how that water just runs off of that? Again, this is dry. Now here's a photograph of real rocks showing how they look and back to our detail rocks. So I'm just trying to emulate that look and I'm just putting little trace amounts of color right on the surface of the rocks. Very watery, very thin. Again, it's very important in between all your different coats that you keep everything dry. Now I used a paper towel there to lift up a little bit of the paint and what you do when you blot that it still leaves some of the paint there and then you can go back over and just add a little bit more just the exact amount you need this gives it that texture and the color of an individual rock rather than just a large painted area it takes a little bit of time to do this this is a very small brush uh, it's uh, about a, oh, a sixteenth of an inch brush maybe an eighth of an inch very small very flexible holds lots of water, lots of uh, the very light thin down paint. Very good way to just spend some time bringing out the highlighted details right on those stones. And as you can see as I work with those individual stones they just look nicer and nicer all the time. Taking a little bit of time doing this adds an awful lot to your your layout. There's that area all finished with a little bit of green added for vegetation. Some close-up detail of those particular rocks. Gives you an idea of what can be done with a little bit of work. Now, this is that area that we did with the individual chunks that we put in there and just blended those pieces together. All you need is a little dirt on the top of these rocks, a little bit of grass and other vegetation, and you end up with a very nice effect. So this is that area that we showed originally uh, where this work was going to be done. See how those two areas blend together well? Very easily done. And here we have some actual rock again to compare it with. When you look at actual rock, this was filmed in Idaho. Different areas have different kind of rocks of course, but the colors there are very close to the type of colors I use on my layout. 
And here's a panoramic sweep across this area that we've been working with here. Notice I've added my background painting at this time. It makes it look better. You can see the detail of the rocks there. Very uh, nice and easy way to do it. Now there's another way we can do rocks. And this is what a lot of people like to do using uh, the actual rock casting itself without putting an, an undercoat on it, either of black or of a lighter color. And that's actually staining the rocks. Now for this what you want to do is you want to let your rocks dry completely, your castings. After you blend them together, uh, I spray water on them for a couple of days and then I let them really set up for about a week so that they're thoroughly dry. And even then I'll come back right when I go to do the staining I'll actually spray, spray the surface of the rock. Now this is black that I'm working with here and I'm getting it very watery. See I'm adding lots of water there because I want this to be extremely thin black paint. Just like straight water. Just as watery as I can get it and still have the paint in it. Now I'm working with a small amount of uh, rock here so I can demonstrate this easily. And this is rock that again is completely dry but I do go ahead and spray it anyway. And the reason I spray it is because I want the, the paint, the stain that I put on to actually run off the faces. And here I apply it. Just touch it on. See how that just runs off the paint? Leaves a little bit of color on the rocks themselves, but it really gets back into those cracks and those crevices. If you want light colored rocks, and light colored rocks are nice on layouts because our layout rooms tend to be dark. So instead of painting really dark uh, rocks, most people like to have lighter color rocks. There you can see how that looks when we're just first starting to put this application on. Now I'm switching to a little bigger brush, doing larger areas. You can even go back over the same areas again. And notice as I go back over, it continues to flow into those crevices and that's what's really going to add an awful lot of good looks to this type of rock. Start at the top, work evenly across. If you need to add more later you can go back over it later. And that's how it looks that whole area when it's it's been done with the black. And again going in you can see how nice the detail is on this and this makes an excellent rock cat coloring just as it is. You don't have to do anything else to it if you like nice gray rock. Now if you want something other than gray, you can't go back over this with another wash of say a very light tan because that light wash would actually wash down into those crevices and defeat all the work you've done. Now if you want to have your rock darker, you can make it darker. Now I'm going to put a thicker mix of black right over in this area here. See how it's still watery, but there's a lot more paint in it. Now I'm going to take my brush aside and dry it off with a paper towel. Then I'm going to come back right across the face of that rock. I'm going to come right across the face of that rock with a little bit of plain water. Adding just plain water and see that washes some more of it off. So you can really control how much paint goes off. Now I'm drying the brush again coming and picking up some of that right off the face. See the type of effect you can get with that? And here we pan across that whole piece. And again, gives you a nice gray effect. Detail is very nice. Now I'm going to use some uh, Apple Barrel brand sandstone. And what I have to, as I said before, we don't want to dilute this down. We have to work with this more full strength. My paintbrush is wet so it's thinned down a bit but if we just made it real thin and washed this on it would go right into those same cracks and hide everything. So what we're wanting to do is just go right across the surface of the rocks like this. A little bit of paint carefully adding it working just with the faces now the underside of these rocks, if you really want to get super detailed, the underside of these rocks would actually be darker than the top side. The sun comes down and my lighting comes down. You can see where the tops of these rocks are. And your lighting really makes a difference. 
if you can have directional lighting, one strong light source, your cracks and crevices are going to turn out much better. I use a, a large amount of natural daylight fluorescent bulbs in my train room. And any time I do my painting, I'm always careful to do my painting in the train room itself. Now I'm adding a little bit more of that Alpo Barrel Golden Brown. It's that nice rust color. Again, I've got water in my paintbrush, so I'm just picking up a small amount of this and keeping it thin using a small brush. Now I'm just going to go over portions of that rock that I've already done with the sandstone, but I'm not covering it all completely. I just want different areas. Again, the areas that stand out, I'm trying to avoid getting down in the crevices. Blend these two colors a little bit for a little bit of variety. And just go ahead and keep working on these rocks a little bit at a time. You don't want your rocks to look like a checkerboard pattern. That's not what we're after. We're not after a, a dark brown one here and a light brown one there. We want them all to be pretty much the same because the the forces of of nature where uh, the thrusting of uh, the strata and everything has gone on causes materials of similar composition to be deposited together. Not always, but similar. One thing I do in a layout room when I work from one end of my layout to the other is I vary the castings and the paintings on those castings so that I might have a very light gray on the left hand side as I work around to the right hand side of the layout I may end up with diff different co colors and different tones of rock castings. Here you can see I'm just going ahead and adding more on the front darkening it up but again being very careful not to get it down into those cracks. We don't want to disturb those cracks and again a little bit of darker color on the bottom of these castings would be good. A little more dark on the bottom. So that's how those castings look right there with that variety of color and everything. The type thing that you would see if you were out walking around looking at rocks. Lots of variety in the color. Next we're going to talk about modeling talus slopes. A talus pile or a talus slope is made up of scree and scree are those little chunks of rock that break off of a cliff. I drove down the road about 10 miles and took this picture. Here's a nice big rock cliff that's been there for about 50 years and you can see there's lots of gravel and stuff that have come down. Now these big rocks are big. They're uh, three feet across but there's a lot of small rock there. So this is what we're going to duplicate next. So I've taken some of those leftover chunks of plaster and broken them up a little bit. You can see them in that tub just there to the left. I've just given a light wash. These are ones I had left over from an earlier batch. Now what I have is I've mixed burnt umber in this cup and I'm going to be putting these rocks into this cup. Now again, this is a real watery batch of burnt umber. You just drop those chunks of plaster down in there and stir them around a little bit so that they absorb some of this color. Then we just take an ordinary spoon. Now I've got some saran wrap on my table there. I just take these chunks out, spread them out to dry on that saran wrap. If you use wax paper, it'll uh, bleed through the wax paper. Uh, you want to do this on saran wrap so it really keeps your table from getting messed up. Of course by the time I'm done with a project like this my table's a mess anyway as you can see. Okay as soon as we get all those big chunks out we're going to reach over and we're going to get some smaller chunks that I've saved from previous projects. They got a little bit of stain on them from before but they're still just chunks of plaster. Put those smaller chunks in there. We want a wide variety of the size of our rocks we're going to use to make this talus slope. We want rocks that are close to that three feet in size and then we want smaller ones and we're going to end up with some very fine powdered material a little later. Just spread that out. Let that dry. Once 
to keep these piles separate for the time being. Spread them out so that they actually dry. I actually let these dry overnight before I go on to use them. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to make some fine powder. Now here I want to work with the actual colors. Actually, let me go ahead and add a little more stain to these. I'm going to use some more of that apple barrel golden brown that I used previously on the rock walls. I'm going to add a little bit of paint here and add a little bit of color to these castings. It's watered down. I'm just touching it to the castings. I'm not dry drawing it across them trying to paint them. I'm just touching it to them ever so lightly. Just adding little bits of color to them. And I'm going to do that on the smaller pile too. You can see this pretty thin paint. And I just touch it to it and just let it bleed down onto it. By doing it this way we still get that dark uh, burnt umber color and we just get highlights with this lighter color. And that's what we're looking for. And here's how it looks close up. Those are what those chunks look like close up. And the smaller pieces. That's what we're after. Now for the very smallest pieces, if you try to do it that way with the plaster, it actually sticks together too much. The big chunks you can break apart easily with your fingers. But what I've done here is I've actually mixed up a batch of plaster and I'm going to add some of the rust color. That's the apple barrel golden brown. I'm going to stir it in. What you want to do is you want to continue to add these colors slowly uh, rather than doing it uh, large amounts. You just continue to add color to it and stir it until it gets just the way you want it. Now I'm going to add some burnt umber. Now one thing you want this to be a little darker than the actual dirt you want to have um, on your layout. You want this to be darker because when this actually dries completely uh, it actually gets quite a bit lighter in color. So I'm adding more of the rust color again. And I just keep working with it until it gets just to the consistency I want. Then I let that dry and I let that dry overnight in that cup. Then I take that cup, break it away from that, break it up a little bit with a hammer, put the chunks into a sock, then I beat it to pieces. Just sit there with a the hammer and keep beating it and beating it until you end up with this pulverized mixture here. It's very fine grain. Looks like a fine grain gravel. You can use this. You can make your own ballast this way if you want. Now at the, the base of the cliff, what we're going to do is we're going to work with the largest pieces first. And I don't really put one here and put one there. I just sort of push them into place. One thing this does is help camouflage that area where the rock casting joins the layout itself. It helps get rid of any gaps there might be there. So we just push those into place. Get them to where they look. Don't use all of them. Save a few. Then after you've done that, go with your lighter material and drop your, your smaller pieces right over the top of those. This would be just how it is at the base of a cliff when chunks of rock come off. And by just dropping in, but into place, they sort of follow a natural course. So there's my really smaller pieces there. Okay, and I just put those on like that. Just let them fall. Some of them roll out into the other area, and rocks roll quite a way, especially the big ones. The big ones sometimes are, are quite a bit off in the distance. Okay, so there we've got th those smaller pieces in place. Get them just approximately the way you want, but don't worry about them too much. Now we come with the real small stuff, and I put this on with a spoon, and I don't put it on starting at the bottom. I just pour it on at the top, just like it was coming down off the side of that, that hill. And that's what we're after. Just let it sort of fall into place. Now I will tap this in a minute to get some of that to work down into the crevices. Just make sure you get all the natural areas filled in. Very good. Just keep adding this. You almost want to hide completely those larger pieces, but not quite. So take your time in doing this. Don't put too much on. That's how it looks close up. 
and then you can take your finger and just rub it around a little bit and bring up some of those smaller pieces that actually show through a little bit in a talus pile. Don't want anything looking odd. You can take another stone if you want and put it on top because large pieces still continue to come down. After you've done, them, done that, you take a, a spray bottle that's got water in it with a, a squirt of detergent, ordinary uh, household dishwashing detergent. Spray it, very fine mist, and you want to get this soaking wet. I can't impress upon you how much wetness this needs to be. Now here's a, a bottle of Elmer's glue and I've got it marked 50-50 but it's not really 50-50 it's about three or four parts water to one part of glue and one little drop of detergent in there and well shaken up. You can see how watery this is. You just start at the top and work your way down making sure everything is thoroughly drenched. You want to make sure all of this is thoroughly colored you let it dry you have your talus slope. I talked earlier a little bit about layout lighting. Well, I'm going to give you an example of what a difference it makes. Now, this first picture, this is a little scene I have of Hobo sitting at the top of a cliff enjoying a campfire. That's my natural room lighting. Now, here's the lighting using artificial light of a different type. Big difference between the two. So you always want to work under the lighting that you have available. Well that's about it. You can see that uh, the fine detail on the rock work here. We now know how to make the molds, how to pour them, how to blend them. The blending is very important and the coloring is very important. I hope you've enjoyed the show. If you have any questions, give me an email.